All right, we're live, I'm told. We're here at <laughs> Mainnet 2022 in New York, Miss Sorry, Mainnet. I'm Dan Roberts, we got Jason Nelson here. Morning, Jason. Morning, Dan, how are you? I'm great. So this is our live streaming booth. We're here in our decrypting Mainnet stage. We first did this a year ago at Mainnet. Now this year it's still in New York, but it's in a different location. We're kind of basically at South Street Seaport. And stick with us for the next three days. We'll be interviewing a lot of the biggest speakers right after they come off stage from their big uh, main stage talk. So Jason, what are you most excited about? We got a lot of DeFi at this conference. I'm looking forward to seeing how DeFi expands beyond the crypto sphere to the average person. I have a talk on that later today. We're gonna be talking about how to introduce DeFi without creating DGENs yep. Yep. <laughs> and, and how we could just make this stuff more mainstream. 100%, I mean, that's the most important thing in all of crypto is onboarding regular folks. And when it comes to DeFi, I always say, it can't just be about making money. I mean, that has been the biggest problem for the industry, especially then when everything crashes. People point at all these liquidity pools and they say they're down bad, they're bankrupt. I mean, DeFi is gonna to have to evolve to the point where there are use cases other than just put this token into this pool and you'll get more of this other token and you'll make money and get rich. Right, well, that's kind of the, PR problem crypto has is a lot of people outside of the industry thinks it's just about getting rich quick. So hopefully moving into 2023, the industry can change that perception and make it something people actually want to incorporate into their daily lives. Yeah, 100%. Yep, and they're not getting rich right now because everyone's down bad. That'll be a big theme at this conference is everyone's here to talk about their investment firm or their DeFi protocol or their platform or their exchange. And it's like, okay, elephant in the room, everything is down bad right now. So it's kind of a tough time to be making the pitch to people that they should be investing in crypto. Right, which is one of the things I'm more than likely gonna to touch on because how do you convince someone to get into a market that looks like this? Yeah. Most of us are already in this industry. We're not trying to convince people to come into it. Or these guys aren't, I should say. Right. So, but how do you do it when there's nothing but red? Yeah. Yeah, that's a tough sell. Well, there's so much to talk about. I'm glad you mentioned your panel. We have a whole team of decrypt reporters here for the next few days, and many of them have on-stage panels that you can watch separately. But here we'll have our booth. We'll be asking people candid one-on-one -on -one questions. We'll have real conversations. So stick with us. And when we're not live streaming, we'll have our little intermission screen. But we'll be back very soon. So next up, we think we're going to have the founder of Solana, Anatoly Yakovenko. So that'll be in just a few minutes. Jason, thank you so much. Thank you. Everyone stay tuned for more Jason and more of our great decrypt staff. And we'll say goodbye for now. Thanks for joining us. Awesome to be here. All right, good stuff. We're at Decrypting Mainnet, Masari Mainnet. Well, let's start this way. Uh, I was chatting a week ago. You know, we're in full-blown conference circuit. You know, fall is conference season. So a week ago, I was at SALT in New York, and I talked to your co-founder, Raj Gokal. And it was just about to be the Ethereum merge. And he said, well, the merge I'm watching more closely is the Helium transition to Solana, which I thought was funny. And a lot of people on Twitter who, who like Solana were saying that. Talk to us about how that went. We have a news story on that today. Helium uh, moving its network over to Solana, to your chain. Yeah, that's pretty exciting. So I think that just speaks to uh, the intelligence of that team. <laughs> I think um, what's cool about it is uh, when we started building Solana, we were already pretty close with Helium. Uh, in fact, like I basically interviewed at Helium before, uh, before Solana was uh, uh, like a thing. We're getting uh, a scoop here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Solana didn't exist yet, and Helium really needed a high-performance network. And they built their own, but you know, it takes a lot of work to build a network. It takes a lot of work to take it from just working and being built to that next stage of uh, like reliability and performance. So at this juncture for them, it makes a lot of sense to drop their own L1 and to move to Solana. Uh, you know, Helium or Nova Labs just announced Helium Mobile, a partnership with T-Mobile to create a true crypto-powered wireless service. You know, what's your take on that and sort of the opportunity you see there? Um, this is pretty crazy. Uh, <laughs> just like I worked at Qualcomm for, for you know, over a decade. Uh, we were trying to figure out a way to like build microcells and to give users like the ability to run their own networks and all this stuff and none of the carriers would have it. This is basically like an impossible battle for engineers. So I'm, I'm really excited about like just the idea of like being able to pull, put your own 5G router at home and have it like function as part of like a decentralized carrier. Just the possibilities are like pretty endless. You can really make this stuff now programmable, use it as like a service layer like you use AWS, just like 
Uh, so me as an engineer, I'm just like as excited as can be. And obviously, Solana is Labs is building a, a phone, right? The yeah, saga. show the phone. There it is. <laughs> it's an awesome Android wow. phone. It's slick. It's fast. Uh, and like the hope is that this device can work on a decentralized network like Helium. So that would be, you know, a crypto first uh, phone working on a crypto carrier. It would be awesome. I mean, no joke, it's really cool to yeah. see that. And uh, what I think about right away is just bringing crypto mainstream to the average consumer. We talk about that a lot because, you know, there's a lot of DeFi talk at this conference. There's a lot of DeFi talk, obviously, everywhere in crypto. But to me, the problem with, with all the promise of DeFi has been mostly that it's been just for making money. People are excited because they can put this token into this pool and make more money. But when you talk about a Solana phone or when you talk about working with Helium and a network, that's actual real world use cases. So, you know, what else excites you, whether it's Solana or anything else, in terms of that effort to onboard more people to crypto? So, I think uh, the next applications for crypto are going to be more complex, more rich, have more interactions, and just really be that, like what you expect at a Web2 app. It's not going to be just clicking on tokens. And to support that, you need extremely, like, simple, awesome custody solutions. So, which is why the saga exists. You need uh, you need the phone to be a hardware wallet, basically, right? U users can't be at risk with like uh, their gaming NFTs if they really value them, right? Every time they, they use these applications. So to me, like this is you know kind of the next obvious step in crypto is how do we make custody simple, custody awesome, and the user experience to be as good as like Apple Pay, and then how do we build applications that leverage that? I wanted to ask about the reaction to the Saga announcement. You know, you had some people who were like, this is a big swing, this is, you know, a huge investment and important. You had other people who were like, well, previous crypto-infused phones, yeah. you know, lol, like that stuff just didn't work out. You know, did you expect that kind of reaction? And, you know, what's your reaction to that? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so uh, it's really, really hard to build a phone. While at Qualcomm, I worked on like half a dozen devices that failed. The Windows Phone, the Amazon Fire, uh, you know, a bunch of ones. <laughs> so, so this is an uphill battle. But I think the opportunity is right right now because the business models for Web3 are so different than Web2. Uh, Magic Eden can't build an application for mobile where a user is charged 30% more for an NFT purchase. Mm. And Magic Eden can't eat that 30% cost because this isn't content that they own. This is true user-generated content mm. owned by the user. And this is different from how Web2 operates. Web2 platforms expect the platform to own the content, and you're really just renting uh, all, the, all the content from them. So this transition is gonna be really, really hard for all of these intermediaries that are getting a 30% cut out of the middle, but it's necessary. I think mm. it's just, you can't have a digital economy where there's a middleman that takes 30% tax and everything. And if it's hard for them and they don't survive, too bad. Yeah. <laughs> um, I got one more for you, and then if you have one more. Yeah. Got to ask you about your take on the Ethereum merge. You know, we, oh, we, we don't talk about that. No, I'm just kidding. But, um, <laughs> you know, the ETH merge happened. It went off without a hitch tech-wise. ETH down terribly since then, which has been interesting. Um, you know, you guys obviously get framed probably to your annoyance a lot as an Ethereum competitor, Ethereum killer. What was your overall reaction to the merge? Um, it's awesome that it went without any catastrophes. I think, like, a lot of respect for the engineers. Uh, those folks are awesome. Um, given that, Solana is still, like, 30 to 50 times more energy efficient than Ethereum post-merge. <laughs> <laughs> and you guys Mike, just released a new energy report. <laughs> yeah. Can you yeah. tell me about what was in that? Um, so we try to measure, basically, server, server utilization, how much power they're taking, and then utilization of the network based on the number of transactions that are being processed on it. And there's a couple different numbers you can look at. One is the total raw count, which puts Solana at like about 500 joules per transaction, roughly half of uh, a Google search. Okay. Or just from applications alone, which would be about 3,500 joules, which is about two to three Google searches. So at the end of the day, Solana is very close, no matter how you measure it, to a Web2 company. Uh, Ethereum uh, post-merge, Per, an average transaction uses up about you know 140,000 tools. So there's quite a gap there. Yeah. Uh, you know, Performance I, matters. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, I wanted to ask one more question about NFTs. You know, the Solana NFT market's booming again lately. Uh, you got Utes and ABC and other projects. You know, what what excites you about NFTs on Solana, and you know, why is it 
picking my, up so much steam again. My kids love the ABC project. <laughs> <laughs> when, when people ask me about NFTs, I show them that, and they yeah. just like, they either they get it right away or they don't get it. It kind of looks like the idea. V Friends of Solana. Yeah, like exactly. That same look. <laughs> um, I think NFTs is like the dominant breakout use case right now. And it's really uh, not, I don't know which way it's going to go, but it really feels like you're looking at like bulletin boards in the 90s and like, okay, some of these are going to be Friendster, MySpace, Facebook, but it's really, really hard to predict. I think if you're, uh, you know, if you're dreaming of starting the next Marvel or Disney, you know, in the next 20 years, it's probably happening right now out of these NFT sets. So the possibilities are, are like endless. And this is a, like, I think the best place to zero to one a brand or a new story or new lore for like whatever, games, movies, uh, IP franchises, whatever you want. So it's early days, but really, really exciting. Good headline about the dominant breakout use case. That's a good, <laughs> we're gonna go write that story right yeah. now. Um, Anatoly, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah. For sure. Awesome Thank stuff. You. We'll Thank be back for... soon with a new guest. Welcome back to uh, Decrypting Mainnet. I'm joined by my colleague Andrew and Mary Catherine Later, CEO of Uniswap, and today we'll be discussing uh, how the top DEX is doing in the bear market these days. Uh, my first question is related to uh, the merge that's just happened. Um, were there any, I don't know, roadblocks, any issues? Was it a smooth transition for Uniswap? Um, how did the update go for you guys running on, on Ethereum? Totally smooth transition. We had a happy hour to celebrate. Some people stayed up all night and watched it. Um, but overall, I think it was such a win for Ethereum, for the Ethereum Foundation, for the Ethereum community. Um, such an orderly uh, transition and merge, and um, everyone, everything went totally smoothly. So um, no impact, no impact for, for, for us. We, did, we put out a blog post, just kind of letting yeah. people know. Um, a couple things to be aware of if you're integrating Uniswap. Um, but overall, I think it was a huge success for crypto and DeFi. I, I was going to ask a follow-up, you know, why do you think the price of ETH has crashed so hard since then? I don't know. I, I don't know. <laughs> like, uh, you know, we, we enable uh, swapping <laughs> and our core technology, we have a value change layer of the internet. Thankfully, that means I do not have, I do not have to think about prices too often. Fair so, enough. It is a total mystery. I'm not selling my ETH. So. <laughs> Good to know. And um, I think a lot of people watching Ethereum, seeing the price tank is maybe not the best thing, but it's obviously great that Ethereum didn't crash when the merge happened. Um, how are other people looking at uh, Uniswap uh, to ter determine how Uniswap is doing in terms of success beyond uh, whether it's crashed or anything like that? I know a lot of people watch, look at TVL, uh, total value locked in the, in the protocol. And uh, how, how do you guys measure success at Uniswap? Yeah, so to total value locked is really not how we measure success. And it's a misleading metric and not the right indicator of how successful, impactful, useful uh, of DEX is. And that's because Uniswap Protocol V3, which we launched in May of 2021, is about 4,000 times more capital efficient. So that means you can have um, many, many, many multiples of trading activity supported by a fraction of the liquidity on any other decentralized exchange. What we do look at, what we care a lot about, is are more people using DeFi? Are more people using the Uniswap Protocol? Are more people using the web app that we um, built and make, that helps make it sort of easy to use and, nav and navigate? Um, we care most about whether more and more people are using DeFi, um, and that's what we think so much the opportunity that, that we're focused on capturing. We also look at, we do look at volume, we look at median trade size to get a sense of like, what are people using Uniswap protocol and our web app for? Are they using it to buy to buy a token to go on participate in a DAO? Are they using it for trading strategies at a much higher volume, something in between? Um, and then overall, we look at our market share. So we look at our market share as a share of total volume traded on decentralized exchanges, and we've been pretty steady around 75% um, for, for months. And we've held strong at that number. Um, our users have um, dropped off a little bit, but not as much as the space overall. Mm. And so overall, I think this has been a, a period of strength for us. I think the bear market's really solidified um, you know, the, the protocol's position, and then and Uniswap Labs, we're really excited about a lot of products we have in the works that will help make it easier to use to find. Gotcha. And to what extent are you, are you uh, how do you think you'll expand uh, Uniswap's market share uh, at the moment? Like, what? Well, I want, to dis I want to distinguish between the protocol okay. and then the products that Uniswap Labs built. Gotcha. And I think it's really critical because the protocol is decentralized. So it is self-executing smart contracts on the Ethereum blockchain, deployed also to layer twos and to sell them now 
Um, but the Uniswap Labs team, so a team of 90 people now based in New York City, um, can't change the protocol. We could all go home, and as you guys know, <laughs> protocol will continue to operate. Yeah. So actually recently a group of uh, some people from the community created a Uniswap Foundation um, funded by UniToken mm. uh, from the Treasury, the community treasury. And they are tasked with grants and other things to help grow the Uniswap protocol. So protocol exists, um, but the vision in creating it, Hayden Adams vision in building, building creating it, was that it would be truly decentralized. Um, Ethereum, I think, is one of the best examples of a decentralized community where yep. you have many different teams working on it. So our core team, the team that I represent, is just one of several teams that works on the protocol. So all that is to say, how do we grow the protocol? Foundation has, is supporting many people who have ideas how to grow the protocol. That's everything from um, education grants, um, community grants um, to, to drive more support in Discord and other channels, um, to uh, people who want to put forward governance proposals to deploy it on other chains um, or layer twos. Um, and all kinds of, people have all kinds of ideas, but literally anyone who has an idea can put forward a proposal for a grant to help grow the protocol. Gotcha. Uh, you, oh, sorry, go ahead. You, you mentioned that uh, Uniswap currently exists on uh, Ethereum, I think it's Polygon, Arbitrum, Optimism, and now Cello, Cello, however people decide to say it. Yeah. Uh, are, are there plans for uh, new integrations with other chains, or is that going to be a question for the foundation and the community? The community, that's totally determined by the community. So each of those came through uh, the governance process. Gotcha. So, um, uh, the seller team, for example, put forward proposal to deploy Uniswap on uh, Uniswap V3 on Celo, and that was voted on by the community. And anyone who has a token can vote their one vote. Um, so that's a question for the community. Again, you know, if, if people want to, uh, if the Avalanche team wants to deploy on Avalanche, shout they can out Avalanche. Put it forward. <laughs> one of the major, yeah, exactly. Um, one of the major, I just one that came to mind. Um, one of the major. Um, uh, challenges though is just the uh, message passing between chains mm. so you have to be able to um, there's still our governance uh, process is still governed on ethereum mainnet effectively and so activity that takes place on other deployments of v3 need to be able to kind of communicate yeah. uh, with the with the governance um, process so uh, figuring out the most secure way to bridge is really important um, but people have addressed that in their respective proposals gotcha. Uh, I wanted to ask you a bit about NFTs. You know, yes. Uniswap Labs acquired uh, Genie, NFT yes. aggregator. Uh, you know, why? How did that come together? And what opportunity do you see there? Yeah. So, I was just talking about how to grow Uniswap protocol. Yeah. And our hope and vision is that Uniswap protocol becomes value exchange layer for the internet. It's still too hard to use DeFi. It's still too hard to, like, do different things in crypto. Mm -hmm. And so, Uniswap Labs is focused on building on our website. Um, just experiences that make it easy for you to interact with your whole digital, app, yeah. digital uh, wallet, digital asset experience. So that was part of the thesis when we acquired Genie. Um, we were really excited about NFTs as a growth vector to get more people into crypto, mm -hmm. to get more people to swap tokens. So yeah. You might not swap certain tokens if you can buy more NFTs, um, etc. And so when we acquired the Genie team, we thought they were an incredible team, amazing founder, they had a great product, they were the first aggregator. Um, and it made a lot of sense to us from a market structure perspective that Uniswap could help uh, create an experience where you can buy and sell any digital asset you might have. So you can buy and sell NFTs on OpenSea, mm. but now starting in a, in a uh, later this fall, um, I don't want to say exactly when, <laughs> we'll, we'll come out soon, but like starting very, very soon this fall, you'll be able to um, buy and sell uh, NFTs on, on Uniswap from a number of different marketplaces. We're just nice. aggregating different marketplaces. So our hope is that that brings your digital asset experience to one place, nice. that it's really like a one stop. I uh, just wanted to ask one more question. You know, what, what opportunity do you see in the NFT lending space? Not something we're looking at. Okay. So um, we don't do lending. You know, you could ask the same question with respect to uh, Uniswap swapping, okay. right? So you can swap tokens, but we don't lend, uh, we don't do any lending. Um, people do integrate the decentralized lending protocols with Uniswap. And gotcha. same thing, you can integrate um, or create some kind of integrated experience um, between, uh, between NFTs um, uh, that you may buy and sell on Uniswap, okay. but that's not something that we're looking to get into. Gotcha. Got anything else, Liam? That's all on my end, yeah. No, I think that's all we got. All right, Mary Catherine, Thanks thank so you so much, much for, for chatting. Me. All right, that's all we have. Uh, please stay tuned. Uh, we'll be back with another interview. All right, we're back. We're live. It's Decrypting Mainnet here at Mainnet 2022. I'm Dan Roberts. We've got Liam Kelly back in the hot seat with us and the real hot seat, Kane from Synthetics. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. You just did your onstage panel. I did. Came right in here to talk to us. 
Uh, we want to talk about all kinds of things. Liam has DeFi questions, Ethereum merge, but I want to start this way. At this conference one year ago, it opened with someone, not you, getting served by the SEC, and that someone was Do Kwan. At the time, I remember people saying, maybe it was Kane from Synthetics, and then it wasn't. But let's talk regulation. Let's talk like SEC, a lot of troubling comments recently from the SEC about tokens, and what do you make of US regulation and all the noise we're hearing? I mean, it's funny, actually. I was almost going to make the joke on stage where I was like, I managed to get through without a subpoena. Uh, but after my talk, I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe they'll be looking for me. But um, look, I think the reality is that uh, regulators in the US have just become uh, much more aggressive uh, about crypto regulation than they were. Um, you know, they've, I think, been uh, sort of going after really uh, obvious bad actors for a long time, right? Like for years and years. Uh, and I think that's kind of shifted in the last, uh, you know, maybe 12 months where, um, you know, even projects that are not necessarily, you know, doing the wrong thing are being targeted. And I think, you know, that is just going to continue. It's very clear that Gensler wants to regulate crypto, wants to have control of it, wants to put a lot of pressure on crypto and, and DeFi in particular. Um, and so I just don't think that's going to shift in the next, like, 12 to 18 months. That's just the environment we're in and we need to adapt to it. Sure. That's, and, and how do you think... DeFi is going to react to this kind of incoming of regulation. It's supposed to be a decentralized, unstoppable world of finance, but uh, it's looking a little bit more stoppable by the day. Well, I think there's kind of two forks we can go down. One is that uh, projects kind of capitulate and uh, go down this like regulated pathway, this like hybrid path of you know having KYC, um, having uh, you know um, like AML checks and identity checks and all that sort of stuff and. Um, you know, blocking particular jurisdictions and all kinds of stuff. Like, I think that's one path we can go down. Um, and it may even be that, like, uh, and, and I think the reality is the projects that um, are forced down that path are probably going to be the more centralized projects. I think the other path yeah. is that it forces projects to get serious about decentralization and censorship resistance and, you know, stop with the governance theater and, like, a lot of the stuff that we've seen over the last, like, two or three years. Um, because the reality is that like, if a regulator has an attack vector and wants you to stop doing something, they can do it. That's intense. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Back in Berlin. Yeah, yeah, no. It, the music is extremely loud. Yeah. yeah. Um, sounds like you've been reading a little bit of uh, Rune Christensen's end game plan, this idea that there's, there's going to be two paths to go, go down. Um, what, what is actually so bad about crypto or DeFi in particular becoming just the next fintech. That doesn't necessarily seem to be a, a bad thing, or in, how do you see that in your eyes? I, I think it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's like ideologically uh, confusing, though, this idea of like having um, this hybrid system which is uh, decentralized at its core, but then has all of these layers of centralization on top of it. Um, and unfortunately, like in order to, um, at least right now with the technology we have, in order to enforce like AML checks, KYC checks, etc., um, there is a degree of centralization that's required. Um, it's not, uh, you know, unimaginable to believe that we'll have projects that will find a way of doing these things in a decentralized fashion. Um, and in fact, you know, I think there are a lot of projects that are trying to do it. If we can do these checks and um, you know have some sort of regulatory compliance that's decentralized, then I, I probably have less of an issue with it. Mm -hmm. I just think that it's been uh, very difficult to achieve that, and so you know forcing regulation and forcing all of these kinds of uh, systems on top of a decentralized platform sort of uh, you know undermines a lot of the utility that you have in a decentralized platform itself. Uh, so that's my main objection. You know, you mentioned that phrase governance theater. And if we can talk about DAOs a little bit, I've been ranting, as Liam knows, for a long time about how, to me, DAO has already become a misnomer. I mean, most of them, they're not decentralized. They're not autonomous. There's nothing autonomous about them. It's human beings voting. And in many cases, they say, well, look, here's an action we chose to take. Well, the DAO voted. Well, yeah, a few key people who have more weight, and it's the leaders. You know, what's going to happen next in terms of progressing to the point where this really is decentralized governance. I mean, it, it kind of has a long way to go. It's been very idealistic for now. I, I think the, the fundamental thing is, is there some discretion in the decision-making process, right? So are there people who uh, have the ability to influence um, outside of like whatever the governance framework is um, a decision? 
And if there is that discretion there, and, and you know, what I was talking about on stage is multi-sigs, right? Like multi-sigs are this discretionary governance mechanism where if we're the token holders and we vote to do something and the multi-sig signer says no, we have no recourse, right? There's no way for us to force them to do that. Um, and that's fundamentally really challenging. And to try and solve that and move fully on chain, we just don't have the tooling. Um, so I think that this is something that, again, regulatory pressure is going to force us to do, to get more serious about removing any aspects of centralization, any discretionary components of systems, and have them be fully on chain. How the decision is made is less important, I think, than making sure that the decision-making process is like robust and transparent. If that's the case, then we can experiment with all kinds of decision-making processes. It just, they need to actually be the real process, right? There can't be some like, underneath kind of layer that's going on. Sure, and, and besides um, more DAO tooling, uh, navigating regulations, uh, as, a, as a DeFi OG, what are some of the trends that you, you, you see in DeFi maybe moving forward, or in some of the trends or things that are happening in DeFi that maybe you don't think is necessarily uh, what could be considered progress? Maybe it's not a good thing for the space. I think the, the on the um, positive side, uh, this transition towards like revenue, right? Yeah. Like towards you know tracking revenue, looking at fees that are generated, um, assessing projects based on like you know are people paying for this service? Um, is it sustainable, um, etc. I think that's something that you know um, is is really positive, and in a bear market, um, hopefully we'll be able to transition to like this much more um, you know. Uh, um, uh, positive metric. On the negative side, I think that like this uh, addiction to airdrops and like continual airdrops is um, something that um, unfortunately we can't seem to like wean ourselves off. I'm uh, I'm just I'm like done with airdrops. I think we need to stop this. It's not the right mechanism for distributing control of a project. Uh, but we don't really have a solution um, to that problem, right? Like, there's nothing really there. So I think until we have a solution to like how do we get tokens in the hands of like a wide group of people, we're going to keep seeing airdrops and they're going to keep being inefficient and really dumb and frustrating. Mm -hmm. I'm done with airdrops. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> Great soundbite. We're going to write that up as a headline. Okay. Anything else for Kane? Uh, my head? No, that's, I'm all good. No all right. Awesome. Right. Thanks for talking cool. to us. Kane right. from Synthetics. We'll be back soon with another guest. Okay, we're back. We're here at Decrypting Mainnet at Mainnet 2022 in New York. I'm Dan Roberts. We got Decrypts. Sander Lutz here today, Hello. and our guest is Jeremy Kaufman of Library. Jeremy, thanks for joining us. Great to be here. Great that we're on video because Library does decentralized video hosting. We got to talk about lots of Web3 things, but first of all, let's start this way. And your t-shirt really helps with this. In case anyone can't see the shirt, yeah, kind of Wall Street bets. It says F the SEC. We can say fuck on this stream. It says fuck the SEC. But let's start this way, Jeremy. At this conference one year ago, Someone got served by the SEC, literally got a subpoena by the SEC at the top of the escalator. It was Do Kwan. But I know you also have had run-ins with the SEC, and you have some spicy takes. Talk to me about the regulatory environment right now. Well, we could have the inverse of that situation here. This, this conference, which would be very exciting, because the library has been fighting the SEC for coming up on five years. We have mutually fired for summary judgment in the federal court in New Hampshire. And the judge said he was going to rule by three days ago. So, and he has to rule by October 3rd or the trial starts, okay? So literally over the next couple of days, maybe I'll be back in the booth if it comes out, we could see that come out. And this is a big case. Um, I don't know how much detail you want to get into, but the facts in this case would apply to basically every company in this room. So it's going to affect a lot of companies. Wow. Yeah. So it's a big deal. And uh, you know, the SEC is very de has very much demonstrated that they are out to damage or destroy the cryptocurrency industry in the United States. Uh, speaking of you know legal matters and in New Hampshire, um, in addition to all the work you do with Library, uh, you are currently on the ballot, I believe, um, as the Libertarian Party candidate for Senate in New Hampshire right now. Uh, could you speak a bit about um, the politics of that campaign and how that ties in or doesn't tie in uh, to your work in crypto? Sure. Well, I mean that's the only way we can make blockchain legal, right? We got to get into office. Uh, we got to pass new laws. Uh, I, I mean anyone who knows me, I'm a very libertarian guy. I kind of wear that on my sleeve. And so I figured, you know, why not run for office? And I've been doing that. I've been um, trying to get the libertarian message out there. I've been making these viral videos. Uh, a lot of them have 500,000 to a million views now. They're these satirical political ads. And to me, it's just another way of, of spreading the message, spreading the gospel of voluntary interaction, free markets. I mean, this is where my heart is at. That's why I live in New Hampshire, uh, by the way, is because that's the most uh, pro-liberty uh, state. So you're not going to find many states where you've got people like me and Bruce Fenton running for office. 
Uh, so if you're a Liberty person, come up, check out the Free State Project. But yeah, I mean, that's what it's about. My, my work is about that as well. But people deserve the, to have the choice of what kind of content they want to watch. You, you, if you think someone something is distasteful, you know, that's, it's just none of your business. If a creator and a fan want to have a relationship, and that's why millions of people are now watching videos on places like Odyssey, which is the most popular library app, because people are fed up. Um, so you know, I think this is true uh, politically, and I definitely think it's true uh, with social media. Uh, the, the people are, are tired of having these bureaucrats, these middlemen making these decisions for them. Um, on the subject of those viral videos, one I came across, which I would appreciate some insight into maybe, now that I have you here, it was about the threat posed to New Hampshire by citizens of Massachusetts <laughs> infiltrating New Hampshire. Wait, I'm from Massachusetts. I haven't seen this video. Well, uh, you know, uh, I'm very, I'm very concerned. Uh, you know, we want to keep uh, the sort of uh, the progressive uh, values uh, outside of uh, New Hampshire. I think we're doing a good job defending it. It is satirical ad, of course, but I'm suggesting that we build a wall with Massachusetts. This is the real border I'm concerned about. Um, no, the truth is actually that the people who move from Massachusetts to New Hampshire tend to be great people. They tend to be the people who don't like the Massachusetts taxes and the Massachusetts gun laws and this kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's a real political movement to concentrate libertarian and crypto people. There's a ton of crypto people. Naomi Brockwell's in, uh, uh, up there. A bunch of other people. We have pro-Bitcoin, uh, pro pro-crypto state reps like Keith Ammon. I'll give him a, a shout out. He's, he'll, he'll pass. You sent him a pro-crypto bill. It will be introduced the next session, guaranteed. Um, so we're really making a difference. This is a good segue. I mean, you know, we can name Elizabeth Warren. We can name any number of sitting senators or, or, or Congress people. What do you make in general of how the two main political parties have uh, said and done toward crypto? Because it, it's been a little surprising, maybe not surprising, but it doesn't always fall on the lines you would think. I mean, some of the loudest, most pro-crypto people have been Republicans. Then there's some young progressive Dems who've said, yeah, you know, I think blockchain is great. And then some of the most vitriolic anti-crypto people, there's been a few on both sides, but maybe more of them Democrats than people would have expected. What do you make of where things stand? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm generally somewhat uh, skeptical of democracy. I think democracy is kind of why we have such bad politicians on both sides. Um, but this is, crypto is actually one of the spaces where uh, uh, everything that's bad about democracy will actually help. Um, because we have, and, and I'm actually optimistic for this reason, because um, we have this massive cohort of people that really care. Um, and democracy is very good at catering to minority interests that really care about something when there's not another side. And that's why the politicians are waiting. And look, politicians are generally unprincipled narcissists, so they don't actually have real positions. But if enough people care about something, then they'll care. And that's why these, I mean, look, I'm glad that whoever they are, I'm not, I'm not specifically calling out any of the pro-crypto politicians, but they're getting, they're getting, they're waiting in because they see this is an issue that a, a, a base of people care about. And there's not a counter base. There aren't that many people that are out there that are actually anti-crypto. I know we see They're just fringe. especially vocal. They, yep. We see this fringe on Twitter, but no one's going to go into the ballot box and not vote for someone because they're good on crypto, whereas there are people who will, go into the, who will go into the ballot and they will vote because that politician is good on crypto. So that's why I think the good guys are going to win this one. So um, if you are skeptical of democracy as a model of governance, are there any other national models uh, globally that... Uh, you find preferable, or specifically with relation to crypto, you consider to currently be more effective? Uh, well, I mean, I think if you like your democracy, you should be allowed to keep it. I'm not trying to take uh, democracy away from anyone. Uh, but I mean, I would say look at the works of, of someone like Curtis Yarvin and his ideas of a patchwork, uh, or you could go back or even earlier to someone like David Friedman uh, and his machinery of freedom. Uh, you know, what the biggest problem in our current society, and it's the same, this is one of the things that Web3 fixes, and, and my company fixes, is its exit rights. It's not voice. It's not voice, it's exit that we lack. When YouTube takes my channel away, yeah. right, yep. it's because I can't easily leave and go somewhere else. And, and the whole model of, of my work is to restore exit rights. It says you get to own your identity, you get to own what you publish. If you want to take that stuff with you out of any place, so if you want to leave Odyssey, you can download your wallet, take it into library desktop, take it into other apps, there's other ones. You can take it into those other places. If we want our politics to get better, we need to restore exit rights. We need an ability for people to leave places that don't work and go to places that do work. And right now, there's no ability to do something uh, new. Uh, it's one of the reasons that uh, Balaji uh, Srinivasan is speaking, of course, at this conference. His ideas of the network state are very important. Free State Project is very important. Seasteading is very important. They say we need new governance. We need new ways of doing things. And we need people to be allowed to voluntarily participate in those systems. And if we do that, not only will we discover new things, we'll see the existing uh, systems get better. Uh, because they start to feel that competitive pressure.
You got anything else? Yeah, just a quick last question. And so if you were to become a U.S. Senator or have a role in the U.S. government, if there was one single most pressing issue, either related to crypto or otherwise, that would be your first priority, what would it be? Well, it's this myth that one senator can actually do something. Right? Oh, so so, yeah, so yeah. like, what I would actually try to do, like, sure, I could write the best pro-crypto bill in the world, but it wouldn't go anywhere. What I will do is use my seat to draw attention, because that's what one person can do, is I can do stunts. I can do, I'll do an illegal <laughs> cryptocurrency transaction from the floor of Congress and ask them to arrest me. So I'll do stuff like that that can actually make some noise. So, you know, I can masturbate and come up with whatever dream bill you want me to say, but it, it, it's not going to happen because that's not how politics works. But what you can do is you can, you can grandstand and, and make the news talk about you, and that's what I would do if I was in office. First, they'd have to actually understand how it works to arrest you. Um, <laughs> let's end on this, you know, especially because you're, you're an advocate for the space and the tech, and you know, you're, you're getting your talking points down. What would you say in general to all the people who they look at conferences like this, I know they're out there, I know you said there aren't as many of them as we think, but they're out there, and they just think, especially you look at the price, you look at the bear market, everything is down bad, it's kind of a tough time to be making the crypto pitch to regular folks. Why are the skeptics and the doubters wrong about this whole industry? Well, I mean, I think, well, <laughs> some of them have some points, and there's parts <laughs> of the industry I don't like, so I'm, not gonna, I'm not actually not even gonna say they're entirely wrong. What, you, what crypto can do, we need to focus on crypto solving real problems, right? Like, like if you look, and Brave solves a real problem. Library solves a real problem. We have real problems, Bitcoin solves a real problem. And I'm, by the way, by omitting something, I'm not saying it doesn't solve a real problem. But we have real problems. Right, we have, right now there's this big fight over uh, credit card companies tracking firearms transactions. Okay, Bitcoin came out in 2014, right, 2013. It's 2022. Why is Bitcoin still not solving this problem? Why, why do I have to care as a firearm, if I'm a firearms uh, seller? Why do I have to care that the credit card company, why can't I easily, why aren't we there yet? I mean, this is what we need to be solving. You know, like, I, I, people who want to do DeFi should be able to do whatever they want, but we need to be fixing this in the real world. People shouldn't be told to buy Bitcoin because it's had, they shouldn't have to understand the federal reserve. They should be able to buy Bitcoin because right. it does something better. You know, and this is what we need to, to be focused on as an industry. So I have some criticisms of the industry. I'm obviously a huge optimist, that's why I'm here. Um, but like, you should be able to go directly to someone and say, not do this to make money, not do this to 10x, do yep. this because you can do this thing that you couldn't do before. Uh, and that, that's the answer the crypto industry needs to be able to give to, to win people over. It definitely can't just be about making more money because yeah. right now, people aren't making money anyway. Uh, Jeremy, thanks so much for joining us. Great chat, and we'll have you back on soon. We'll thanks, talk to you again. Fun. Awesome. Thanks. We'll be back soon with our next guest. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're at Decrypting Mainnet here at Mainnet in NYC, Mainnet 2022. I'm Dan Roberts with Decrypt, and I have Ilya from Near, the founder of Near. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for inviting. Awesome. So, Ilya, there's lots to talk about. I mean, we got a hustling, bustling crypto conference here. Even though it's a bear market, there's a lot of things to get into. But let me just start with an easy one. What is new and exciting at Near that everyone should know in the world of smart contracts? What's going on? For sure, yeah. So we just actually had our conference, NearCon, in Lisbon last week, which was three days, 3,000 people, amazing energy, really good vibes. So uh, check out the videos, but also, you know, don't miss it next time. But there was a lot of things coming out. I think the kind of the most interesting things to keep track on is we actually just today, uh, the protocol team just released a new version of the protocol. It's actually advancing, continuously advancing our like sharding roadmap. So this is increasing number of validators, decentralizing, reducing the requirements for the nodes as well, like while kind of adding extra capacity. Uh, we had uh, Sweatcoin launched. So Sweatcoin is a move to earn app that has 120 million installed in first week. So they separated wallets into separate apps, which is an amazing user experience. And they got 2 million installs for that app in first week. They're right now top app in Web3 on active, weekly active uh, users, and they probably are the top app on user period because they actually don't like they're civil resistant systems, so they actually don't have bots versus like most of probably other apps that have like account based is probably bot. That's good. Get them out. No bots. <laughs> no, no. I mean, it's not, it's not about that. It's just like the, the numbers you look at, like active, like weekly active accounts, like it's accounts. So there's a lot of like if we're talking about like Pancake Swap or Uniswap, etc. There's a lot of bots yep. that are training there. It's not like it's not always all real account, like real people behind the things. And so there, here you have real people walking, using this app, installing them, and so staking, you know, already like transacting. And there's a lot more stuff coming out from that ecosystem. And so I think that will be the biggest kind of onboarding channel for not just near, but the whole Web3. That is really cool about Sweatcoin because I talk a lot about 
you know, wanting to see real use cases. Yeah. Um, you know, over on Solana, I remember experimenting with Stepin, which is also doing move to earn. You're starting to see more apps that are about something in real life, not just making money. Exactly. You know, like yeah. This conference is very heavy on DeFi, but I always say, like, DeFi can't just be about put this yeah, token. Move, yeah, move the money in the circle. Money. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Now I make more money. Meanwhile, in the last six months, no one's making money. Um, <laughs> Talk to me a little bit more about what excites you in terms of cool, real-world use cases you've seen for crypto and, and decentralized apps. For sure, yeah. I mean, I think on the finance side, what I'm really excited about is the combining of kind of bringing crypto into real world, right? So this is in both ways. Like one of the cool projects called NearPay, they're actually allowing you to use your Near account as a bank account. So you can issue a credit card and, you know, with Apple Pay and Google Pay over time, you will have IBAN, so you can wire money, so it like turns that account, but then obviously from there you can use all the DeFi and everything and like trade and whatever, but like kind of like it gives you an experience of a neo bank versus a crypto experience where you're like, what is going on, right? And so I think from there, there's a lot of interesting things from like bringing real world assets, right? I mean, this can be uh, equities, this can be mortgages, like any kind of things like that, that you can bring in and actually expose it to this bigger kind of audience that is interested in different in different ways to uh, interact. I think the the other pillar is creative, right? I think we've seen obviously NFTs as a as a driver, but it's not it's just a tool, right? The reality is it's about people being creative and being able to find their audience and market and being very close to them. And that's why I think the kind of the next sector that have not been yet very like hip and hyped is social is where actually like, because bringing this like, now that you have finance and, crea and creative side, you have all these communities and ecosystems. And so right now they're all sitting in Discord, which is to be clear, like not the modern world social network. It's not? <laughs> Discord isn't the whole world? Yeah. <laughs> and so, so you'll see a lot more kind of social, new interactions, new ways to incentivize and nudge people in different directions. I think one of the apps that again launched in NearCon is Niche, which is from founder of uh, uh, like Tinder and Bumble. Oh. That uh, yeah, they're building pretty much a NFT enabled sub community. So let's say if you do have a NFT, you can, or or from a collection or from a feature or maybe like just a ticket for a, for a concert, you can build a sub community around that, and it's very like you know like Instagram, TikTok experience, you know, chats and stuff like this. So I think that's really the interesting direction where it's going to be kind of closing up the circle in a way where you go from this creative space that forms communities, communities start to form ecosystems and kind of this like more vibrant places and then they actually will want some ways of monetization, financialization. they'll launch tokens, they'll create economy around that and so you kind of have a more and more, it's almost like economy supply chain, right? more and more value created. I hope so. That sounds great. Um, <laughs> you guys are proof of stake. You know, near is Correct. a proof of stake chain. So you were already uh, proof of stake. Let's talk a little bit about the Ethereum merge, which okay. just happened. You know, people thought that was going to be really big for the space. It happened. You know, the tech went off without a hitch, um, using less energy now. But of course, ETH, the asset, way down since then. But as someone who has a, I don't want to say a rival, you know, blockchain, what did you make of the Ethereum merge and the reaction to it? I mean, honestly, like I am a big proof of stake, uh, kind of, or I'm I'm against proof of work to be clear, uh, for a few few different reasons. And I, I, I mean, I was happy to see this transition happening for sure. I think the Ethereum has a very hard job of like making sure that everything is you know correct and coordinating way bigger ecosystem right than any of us. And so I think that you know you should we should celebrate that that they are able to. I think for me generally, I, the, like I believe in continuous innovation, continuous improvement, and that's kind of you know near, you know, you're not there, but you know you can always get closer. And so, I think the kind of for me the part of the lesson here is really about like how do we actually build decentralized governance? Because like I think the fact that it was like kind of you know. I mean, it wasn't that super active that people were trying to fork for work. Like, I was actually expecting more uh, activity there. But even, like, this whole thing where, like, because it's not, people people don't have a mechanism of, like, you know, 
com commitment to a decision, right? It's, right now, it's very much like people tweet on, te on, yeah. on Twitter, there's Telegram groups, Discords, somebody's writing EAPs, like some there's developer some calls. Devs, and then there's everyone else. Yep. Exactly, yeah. So there's, like, there's, there's no like way for, for questions that are really important to bubble up to a community, as well as kind of having a way to influence decisions that may be happening in this. And this is actually what, what uh, one of the things we, we announced at NearCon is we're working on Near Digital Collective, which is an ecosystem governance body, which is designed to kind of focus on like and organize this kind of structure. So there's like kind of lower level work groups that are designed for specific problems like protocol governance, standard governance, uh, wallet governance, etc. They handle kind of problems of that scope, and then you have almost like a congress, which is representative of stake stakers and representative of people who have merit. So people who are actually contributing and working full time yeah. in the ecosystem, and so this is like a two house system, and so that is where questions that are cover the whole ecosystem will bubble up and, and make decisions there. There's like loading and such. So we have a huge like actually like over 100 contributors right now working on constitution, on structure, on voting, on technical uh, parts of that of that system. But I think like for me, kind of looking through this process, right, and, I'm, and I've been looking through this for the past four years, to be clear, right. Like, I think that's the lesson I take. Like, they did an amazing job, but it was like very, very inefficient in a way because they needed to kind of go against a, a, an absent process. So they needed to coordinate across a very unexisting structure, like a very decentralized and for a good for a good reason, very decentralized structure that there's no way to like commit and execute. It's always always like you know two step forward, one step back kind of thing. Yeah. But again, like. Huge celebration for, I mean, they did an amazing job, and I mean, I know a lot of core developers, like, obviously, huge props to them. Uh, two last questions for you. One big one, everyone in this conference is talking about regulation, especially, you know, I mean, it's, it's a global issue, but here in the U.S. is what gets the most attention, because you have certain comments from SEC Chair Gary Gensler just the other day, some troubling comments about what constitutes a security. You guys have the token, I mean, everyone has the token. What would you like to see happen when it comes to regulation? What are you hoping will be the new uh, the new framework? For sure, yeah. So I, I think of, of it from kind of product and uh, first principles. So first principles is we want to protect users and investors, right? We don't want people to get scammed, to lose money, to interact with systems that are unsafe or not valid. And this is why you know SEC was formed to protect investors from fraud, fraud fraudulent activity. And so if we think of this and we think of like, okay, we not, now have a blockchain, which is a way to, for people to agree, to participate, to contribute, to organize, right? How do we use this tool to actually govern and protect users and investors? And so from this perspective, one of the projects in the New York system is to build a on-chain asset registry where the assets are kind of added there, they've been reviewed by the community, they provide kind of the feedback on you know the kind of asset token economics, the, the kind of the team, the structure, everything like that. Uh, kind of the, the idea, it can be legal review, it can be like so smart contract review is attached there as well. So you have you can have all the information in one place and on chain governed by a DAO, and now you can have all the other tools, wallets, other apps, exchanges, yeah. banks, insurance companies, SEC, whatever else can source this data directly from on chain to validate that this specific address, not just like a USDT or this specific address, is indeed validated, security reviewed, and being like used by a community in this and this way. And so maybe for each government and jurisdiction has like a legal opinion from a lawyer as well committed on chain. Right? So you can have all the information in one place, but then you still have like a should be a very diverse DAO of regulators, of industry experts who will be governing and kind of helping this process. Unchained registry sounds very smart to me. I'd like to see the registry. Um, let's end on this. I want to mention this. You are Ukrainian. Correct. We have covered in depth the ways in which crypto, at least for a time there at the beginning, and of course the biggest problem is like people's memories are short and the yes. news cycle moves yes. on and it's like you guys are at war. Um, we covered all the ways in which crypto was sent to Ukraine, donated to certain causes. There were DAOs that we wrote about that raised money. Is that still happening? How have you seen crypto be involved in, in the fight over there? Yeah, so, I mean, in the beginning, it was pretty much a lifeline because, well, like, I remember, you know, I was actually in New York when war started. And so the first thing was like, okay, how can I help? You know, I want to donate some money. 
and was like, well, is banks going to be okay? Like, are they going to be bombed? Like, yeah. you don't know, right? Like, if you, if you send a wire transfer, it may arrive, may not arrive, maybe there's no bank tomorrow. And so crypto was actually a safe option. Um, and so, and then obviously, like, it was fast. We could deliver deployed capital for, like, so, and we, like, a bunch of founders from crypto ecosystem in Ukraine started on chain funds. It was a great proof of the point of crypto. Exactly, yeah. It was, like, it's resilient, it's fast, it delivers help directly to people. We had, like, we have 5,000 volunteers at some point operating in Ukraine, you know, it's food. Like, people would get, like, you know, like, a hundred, two hundred dollars, buy some food and deliver it to, like, you know, grandparents who, who don't have, like, anyone to help them, to people who, you know, got into trouble, etc. like, just really distributed it, like, operating that, you have, and we have transparency reports and all the analytics, right, directly from that. I mean, yes, it kind of slowed down, so right now, actually, Unchained Fund is mostly focused on UBI, so it's a, it's a Unchained help card that uh, women with children who may not have uh, their, like, uh, spouse um, receive 25 euro per week per person, to, uh, and then they be able, like, pretty much able to, you know, live and kind of get out of the state where they cannot do anything. And so it is very similar to like universal basic income, right? Yep. But it's for a specific, very vulnerable uh, audience. And so that's been going, and so this is the kind of a more longer term program that's been running from Unchained Fund. The really cool thing that happened uh, a few weeks ago, uh, kind of folks from Unchained Fund and Ukraine DAO organized a Kiev Tech Summit, which was kind of Web3 focused hackathon for developers who are in Ukraine. Vitalik came actually. Yes, uh, the, a surprise yeah. appearance. Yeah, and then the government was there, so that it was really cool. And, and kind of the point there being a lot of, in Ukraine, a lot of developers are in outsourcing. And a lot of companies, their clients, have been cutting ties uh, with Ukrainian companies because their risk model cannot acknowledge something, a company that's in a country which is at war. And the point is Web3 doesn't care. Web3 doesn't care where you're coming from. Web3 doesn't care what's going on around you. If you build a great product, and you deliver them to your users, you will be you know, rewarded with that. And so I think the point was to kind of educate Ukrainian developers in mass that there is an opportunity that actually like spans beyond like you know, in this digital realm. And so I think that was pretty successful. It was, I mean, a lot of really great people who showed up. I, I was tuning in online, but yeah, it was really, really, really inspiring. So I think like this is kind of the spirit is like now it's more about how do we give the tools to people to be successful and, and actually bring money and then as you know this war finishes up Ukraine wins you know any like tomorrow I think uh, is like how do we rebuild right so what are the like can we have DAOs that buy out buildings and renovate them can we have like you know organization that maybe help a city for example and create like a, a internal currency for the city to like bootstrap liquidity because you know they don't actually have the local money like the, all kind of things where you can actually deploy a very like localized solution using blockchain technology to solve their problems. So That's I'm really yeah encouraging. I'm encouraging everyone to actually like participate in that because there's a lot of there's a lot of use cases you can build out of that because a lot of regular infrastructure is destroyed so you may as well actually innovate. That's very encouraging. Uh, I hope it ends very soon and I hope crypto can continue to help. Ilya thanks for joining us. For sure yeah. Ilya Thank you only need to know the one name Ilya and <laughs> we will be right back here soon with another great guest. Okay, we're back. It's Decrypting Mainnet at Mainnet 2022. I'm Dan Roberts, and we got the man himself right here, Ryan Selkis, CEO of Masari. Ryan, what's up? GM. Having fun. GM. All right. Yeah, not bear market vibes. Bear markets are good for getting the right people in the room. So I like that. I feel, I feel good so far. It, it's funny you say that. I mean, everyone for six months has said, well, this is a time for building. We're heads down and building. And that kind of became a punchline back in the previous crypto winter. But I actually feel, I'm not just saying this, I actually feel like it really is happening. People are using this time to focus on things that matter and launching real things. And it's also a shakeout where the things that are kind of going under, it's because they weren't operating efficiently, they were operating in a way as if they thought it would just be up only forever. I think we've seen this every single cycle, right? 2013, there was a bunch of altcoins and like forks of Bitcoin and you know a lot of real crazy kind of Wild West stuff. People forget about that cycle, they just remember the 2017 cycle. At least those entrepreneurs had to raise with white papers and like some moon math or you know pretend that they were scientific about it. And then I think in the last couple of years, we've actually seen some real zero to one innovations in DeFi and NFTs and DAOs and, and uh, not to mention all the scaling improvements that have been made for you know, the big ecosystems and the merge last week. So I think um, 
you know, people, uh, people have to be patient. Uh, a lot of this is getting built out in parallel. And I have the benefit of having been through a couple of these cycles. I know you have uh, as well now. So like I've actually seen it come to fruition. And when you, when you see the, the iterative improvements and kind of the quality of the things that are being shipped kind of go up into the right, and you've seen the compound growth of all these different systems interacting with each other, with, with each other um, it's a little bit easier to believe than just, you know, if it's your first time trying to convince yourself that this is actually, you know, it's all going to come back. But um, I think, uh, you know, now's, now's a good time to, uh, to figure out who the true believers are, right? So it, 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 we wash away all the dead wood, we yeah. attract a new market, you know, 90% of them wash out, the other 10% still kind of form the base for that next level. So yeah, that's, that's happened every four years, and, you know, it looks like it might happen again for better or for worse. I like that take. Uh, you mentioned the Ethereum merge. That's probably been among the biggest crypto industry news of the past week, two weeks. Yep. What was your reaction to that? I mean, great that it went off without a hitch. Tech-wise, ETH, the asset, the price, down bad since then. What do you tell folks who are like, woof, this is a tough time if you're a big Ethereum supporter, especially we can get into the guidance from the SEC and Gensler and concern about what's a security. What do you make of everything post-merge? Well, Jeff Bezos has that classic line of the, the markets being a weighing machine in the long term mm -hmm. and a voting machine in the short term, and we're we're at the voting machine phase yeah. right now. Right? Um, you know, from from my vantage point, I, you know, I'll be honest with you. You know, so, so hats off, kudos to everybody that was uh, integral to the the development of the merge and, and the lead up and, and all the milestones that kind of went into that. I've had a truism for myself the past four years when it comes to the merge or ETH2 or whatever they were calling it at the time, always take the over. <laughs> and now it's now it's been pushed, right? So so you can't take the over anymore. It is a massive milestone. I think it's a huge de-risking event. And um, I think a lot of the criticisms about, you know, Ethereum being captured or, you know, this creating some other um, unforeseen or, or kind of uh, unfavorable outcomes for the industry. I, I think that's largely overblown. I think it's a huge milestone, and um, and in the medium to long term, it's going to be a massive tailwind, not just for Ethereum, but for anything that's EVM compatible, kind of building on that infrastructure. So um, excited. We're going to have Vitalik uh, with Zuko for a session on Friday and be able to pick his brain a little bit. And then we have a, a few other folks uh, on Ethereum core and that have been kind of building up to the merge tomorrow morning as well. So. Um, We'll have some good perspectives here, and, and I know uh, I know it's a relief uh, that, that you know it's it's kind of on to the next challenge. But yeah. That one was a uh, right. big big monkey to get off the back. Shanghai Fork next, yes. yes, that's so true that a lot of people looking you know from the outside looking in just don't realize just how impressive it is that it finally happened. Yep. I mean, being in this industry for years, like you know, forget just the price action. The merge happened instead of continuing to wait. Exactly. When's it going to come? Um, a year ago at this conference, and we were here. We did our decrypting mainnet series. Someone got served by the SEC at the conference. Of course, it later came out that person was Do Kwan. Surprise, surprise. And that was back before all the Terra Luna collapse. Um, let's talk about the SEC. I love your voice on Twitter. You are uncut. You don't care. You'll, you'll say your view. What's your latest thinking on Sheriff Gensler, as many have called him? Well, you know, I don't know if someone will uh, have a similar incident this year, but... You know, uh, we got the sniper rifles at the, <laughs> on the roof, so anyone, they're going to at least have to buy a ticket this year. Uh, I'm kidding, obviously. Um, or am I? Uh, no, uh, so look, I mean, that, that sort of thing happens. It's, um, uh, we have a lot of really good folks, executives in the industry, and, and, and people that are pushing the envelope, mostly for, for the good, you know, sometimes in, in hindsight. Um, things break and, and people get in trouble, and, and that's really been the nature of crypto since day one. But I think um, anytime you have a group of folks like this, just the, the law of large numbers, right? There's going to be thousands of yes. folks here. Some of them are international. If some of them are under investigation, then that might happen from time to time. I um, I don't get that vibe right now for sure, um, and uh, and so uh, when it comes to the uh, kind of the regulators in the U.S. and, and kind of policymakers. Yeah, we have a CFTC commissioner that's going to be speaking with me Brian tomorrow. Quintens, oh, the current no, one. No, um, Carolyn Pham will be speaking with me for a fireside tomorrow. Um, we have a representative from the DOJ who's going to be speaking on a, a, a privacy panel with uh, someone from the Electric Cash Company and, and a couple of other privacy entrepreneurs. So, you know, these should be conversations, right? Yep. There, there's, there's a lot of positive innovation in the industry, and a lot of that's on display this week. The... Um, the question is who's going to operate in good faith, 
you know, it's not enough to say, come in and talk to us and, you know, register How? with us and act in good faith if you haven't been operating in good faith. And so that's been largely the criticisms that I've had for the current SEC chair. Um, and, uh, and look, they, it is what it is, right? Uh, I will change my tune when, uh, when we see a change in behavior. Um, but I, I would say that hopefully that is becoming more the exception than the rule of, uh, of engagement, not only in the US, but in Europe with policymakers. For the most part, people seem to be on the same page in terms of you know, driving more constructive solutions versus you know, the, uh, the proverbial hammer that's looking for a nail. Uh, great stuff. Last question for all those watching. I hope we got people watching our live stream and they'll watch the finished video. What would you say to people who are following along from home, watching the conference? Maybe they're wishing they were here, but they care about these things. They're in the industry. What would you tell people they should either look out for or what's most interesting right now and exciting? Well, I think they should be here. So lesson <laughs> learned for next year. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think now is just a time to decompress a little bit, absorb, learn. You can play with some of these applications now, right? Like, I mean, we, we forget that yeah. last year and a half, I mean, I remember during kind of the early stages of DeFi summer, I said I wanted to do a... Uh, Welcome to the Eucrypsing Mainnet. We're here with Roniel of Audius. How's it going? It's going great. Having a great day out here. Awesome. Yeah, it's a little cold in this uh, room, but we're doing great. And we want to talk about music, crypto, Web3, NFTs. How is music fitting into the crypto space? But first off, let's just get it out of the way for those who might not be familiar with Audius. Can you tell us a bit about what Audius is and how it's working in the music space? Totally, yeah. So uh, Audius is a music community and discovery platform that puts the artist in control. So that putting the artist in control is kind of what differentiates Audius from a lot of the Web2 era um, uh, music distribution tools. And Audius is able to do that by being fully decentralized. So using the tool chain on, on Audius, as, a, as a, an artist, you're actually interacting directly with fans. You're, distributing content directly to them, you're receiving payment just back directly from them. Um, and uh, we think that's really key to uh, uh, kind of this emergent music economy that, that we're seeing uh, uh, around more direct commerce between artists and fans, less, you know, uh, the uh, one-size-fits-all streaming that we see so far. Yeah, what sort of growth have you seen with Audius over the last year or two? Yeah, so uh, um, the product launched publicly about two and a half years ago. Today serves about seven and a half million fans on a monthly basis, uh, over 250,000 tracks, and uh, recently crossed a million artists. Or, sorry, uh, sorry, 250,000 artists recently crossed uh, about a million tracks. So, uh, uh, so yeah, we've seen um, you know growth uh, uh, continue through this you know market uh, uh, cycle of sorts because the. The average audience user is uh, not even aware there's really any crypto there. <laughs> They're getting the benefits of uh, decentralization without, um, you know, without having to be super aware of how to use a wallet and all of these sorts of things. Right, and Andrew, you mentioned to me earlier before we jumped on that you tried Audius before you yeah, checked it, it out. What it was your feels, first impression? Yeah, it feels like a Web2 app with a Web3 backbone. And I was, I was actually going to ask, like, how many of your users actually know that they're interacting with a Web3 app? And how intentional was that kind of design on your part? Yeah, so, um, so a, as a uh, point of reference, we see in, uh, in our analytics, less than 10% of uh, Audius users have MetaMask installed already. Um, so uh, it gives you a sense of, like, the average Audius user is not a crypto-native person. Um, we don't have hard evidence to know how many of them know there's there's crypto or not, but at least anecdotally, and you know when we've surveyed people and whatnot, um, I think what we've seen is uh, uh, the majority are aware that uh, Audius is, is decentralized in, in some capacity, but um, they they aren't aware that their user experience is actually decentralized and they're yeah. using Audius. Uh, like you said, you know when someone signs up for Audius, they I uh, uh, can do so without already having a wallet and without already being onboarded to crypto. I think that's what's helped us uh, uh, grow to the size of the network we are now is that kind of approach to usability. And it, it was a very intentional approach. Um, uh, the, uh, the philosophy for, for the audience ecosystem has always been to provide as much uh, benefit to our users and our, our ecosystem as, uh, as we can. 
uh, uh, from the perspective of decentralization without uh, forcing them to you know come in with a lot of knowledge there, right? And I, I think um, our community struck a good balance there of, uh, of, of uh, optimizing for both of those things. Yeah. So when it comes to comparing Audius to other platforms to perhaps better understand it, learn the advantages and maybe disadvantages, what would you say um, are reasons someone should go on Audius as opposed to Spotify or another Web3 platform? There's a lot of different ones popping up every day. You know, we have like John Legend created our song or is founding our song, and we have Lau doing different drops on Royal, which is a, a less of a, a marketplace and more a little bit more of a drop-focused platform. But can you speak to you know what makes Audius different from these competitors, and should I cancel my Spotify premium and just go on Audius? <laughs> Yeah, so um, I actually would say no, you shouldn't cancel your uh, Spotify premium membership, but you should use uh, Audius alongside of it. So I, I think um, you know, Audius is, is not trying to compete with Spotify or Apple Music or any of these existing music uh, listening experiences today. Um, what Audius is trying to be is uh, the place for super fans of an artist to aggregate to uh, interact with one another to form communities around their favorite artists um, and uh, uh, to date that's what we've seen is you know many of our larger artists for example that have uh, large monthly listenerships and followings on other platforms Audius is becoming the place you know not where they share all the same things they share everywhere else but where they're sharing like the works in progress the content that didn't uh, didn't make it to the album these things that like these highly, highly engaged fans who want to hear everything that comes out from a given artist um, will search for and seek out. And those people come back to Audius again and again and again to hear this long tail content that they can't find anywhere else. Um, that being the root of um, sort of this super fan uh, relationship uh, uh, kind of building structure that exists on Audius, um, you know, we, we actually see the kind of usage models and monetization models for Audius being much more akin to like a Patreon or like a, an OnlyFans sort of a, a thing where you're as a fan getting that level of closeness relationship with the artist and we do like a Spotify or something. Um, with respect to the uh, crypto names of uh, folks building at that intersection of Web3 and crypto, uh, we're more than excited to see uh, lots and lots of folks exploring these different trade-offs, use cases, and uh, I think that's uh, one of the amazing things about this space too is even though things might appear to be competitive on the surface, um, you know, like Justin Blau is an advisor uh, to Audius from from way back when, and like. We're big fans of Royal. It's not uh, the market opportunity we're going after, but I'm excited that someone is. And there's a lot of space for all of us to play here. So, um, yeah. And yeah. and what would you say to artists, maybe independent musicians or or even big artists who are a little wary of crypto and they've sort of heard about oh, crypto's you know bad or dangerous or a scam, or whatever. What would you say to those artists who are maybe a little curious or a little wary? And they're they're not really sure about how crypto could change music. Yeah, my my uh, biggest advice would be try it. Try uh, playing with these tools in a low commitment way without uh, uh, you know taking on risk and uh, you know from your perspective of your brand anything else like you have nothing to lose uh, uh, by playing around with these things and. Um, yeah, unfortunately, to you know, to what to your question, um, there is this perception that crypto is hard to use, crypto is scary. Um, you know, my money is going to get stolen from me if I'm in crypto, or you know, this uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's it's for speculation. Like all of these these sort of misconceptions that people have about crypto, um, when they start using uh, these tools and and just see, oh hey, you know, this is just another cool way to engage my fans and one that uh, maybe monetizes um, better or in different ways from my existing channels. We're not cannibalizing what I already have, but we're creating net new revenue for ourselves. Um, it's, it's impossible to like not see the logic of it, I guess, at that stage, right? Because it's like, you really have nothing to lose and uh, uh, you know, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't, doesn't hurt to uh, experiment here, right? It Definitely. doesn't uh, harm your brand. 
uh, maybe we should close with one final question. You know, music NFTs is like the big buzzword right now in the NFT space. Um, is that something that Audius is looking into? Do you see potential integrations of, of music NFTs with the platform? Yeah, so you can already use um, NFTs minted elsewhere on, on Audius to uh, you can curate this collectibles page yeah, on your profile. Your you can do. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, you can you can like you know attach various functions to the holding of that NFT. So if a fan has one of those, um, we're really excited to continue down that um, that set of paths. I think music NFTs broadly um, are, are really exciting and and uh, kind of the bleeding edge, like you said, of um, uh, kind of this like crypto creator economy intersection point. Um, before we can see them reach a uh, more mainstream audience, I think we need to see price points come down and utility being delivered in return for the purchase or holding of one of these NFTs go up. And I think that combination of things, um, uh, I, think, I think music NFTs, you know, like five years, 10 years from now, will start to replicate some of the, um, you know, think about like when we were all kids, right? And and we'd go to the record store and like buy a CD and that was like, there's something kind of special about yeah. that aspect of collecting music and also sort of demonstrating, you know, what values and what identity you sort of have as an individual through the music you've collected. Um, I think music NFTs can serve that same itch, right? In, in today's music listening world of you know one size fits all streaming music is as ubiquitous as you know like the water in our pipes right like no one no one thinks about music really being valuable uh uh it, you know or consumers don't because it's ubiquitous and effectively free and i think um you know charging a price for you know maybe not all of your music as an artist but for some of it through uh, music nfts through other means will only serve to, um, you know, create uh, uh, that same sort of collecting mindset and experience that people once had. And yeah, it will be for a smaller subset of your fan base, yeah. but, um, but that's okay, right? Like not all of your music has to be heard by everyone. Yeah, and, and maybe NFTs could help reshape people's minds in the way that they think about collecting music like you oh, said yeah. we can have this sense of okay yeah it's just like i'm going to the bookstore of course you're not going to just take the book yeah. you're going to buy the book you know and so maybe that will help reshape the way that we think about music too a hundred percent yeah um, just bringing more thoughtfulness back to how we listen to music great well thank you so much for coming on and chatting with us here at decrypting mainnet thank you for thank having you. me thank you